Well, thanks, and it's great to be with you. To, I know I've got, I think we've got presentations going everywhere. So great to talk to you a little bit about I-85 response and rebuild. I liked your, uh, I liked your announcement behind the barricade. So I'll give you some inside baseball and share some things with you that we don't usually share. So some things need to remain a secret. Y'all good with that? Everybody keeps a secret, right? I'm looking in the camera when I say that. So this, that'll be on the web before, before we finish, right? So uh, talk to you a little bit about some of the strategy and how we address truly a failure of critical infrastructure. And I actually gave this presentation just last week up in Washington to a resiliency committee, uh, transportation officials, to focus on how do we deal in disasters and things that you can't really prepare for in a way. And so previously I called this preparing for the unknown. And uh, especially the, your presentation next week dealing with what can happen in weather events applies here as well. And, I, and some of that's very translational, so I'll talk to you about that. But one thing that happened with the I-85 uh, instance was we obviously saw the need and the criticality for redundancy in a transportation system. I know you guys are talking about a lot of different types of systems. But in a transportation network and system, redundancy is very important. And also, it emphasized and highlighted something that's being talked about at our legislature right now is the need for transit expansion in Metro Atlanta. Because when you lose a section of roadway, you don't have other alternates, transit becomes very vital. So, and I'll go into some detail about that. So, what I want to do, in case you weren't in Atlanta about this time last year or toward the end of this month, I'm going to highlight, uh, give you a little bit of a set the table video that sort of goes through this. So let's see if I can make technology work. Oh, no, nope. make it work too well. Who's doing that? That was crazy. <laughs> okay, that was a great presentation. I hope you enjoyed it. In conclusion, well, it's a quick, quick class. Wow, it's really freaking out. There you go. Okay. Oh. We're really fast. Yes. All right, so who was here last March? Okay, so not everybody was here. Okay. So, um, can try and maybe use that one over there. One. Is that aim, yeah, aim that or? Use, can use this one. Okay. Yeah. Sorry about that. Are not going to have them on both screens? They are on both screens, but they're unfortunately not connected, so we have to do it separately. <laughs> All right, so everybody sat on this side, got sat on the right side. So. Right, Chris, you're going to get, we're going to be on this screen too, right? And right. Going to yes, as, as soon as I can get it to work. <clears throat> oh. So a long time ago, there were things called silent movies. <laughs> Everybody watched very intently because you tried to reach people's lips of what they were saying. That's not true. They broke a screen. They had the dialogue. You had to, well, I don't have the closed caption piece. That's the only problem. Those were great movies. All right. So, as the fire uh, progressed, right, right. no, you got it. Both of them coordinated, so uh, you're talking to both sides of the room. There we go. Aha. Uh -huh. We now have control back to. <laughs> I don't know if I want it. <laughs> I know. Let's see here. 
There you go. The last thing you pushed took it off the screen. Yeah. Yeah, there's the All missing right. audio yeah. cable. Okay. Yeah, oh, it's okay. It's all right. Right. Can we get back to the opening slide? Yeah. This one? Yeah. No. Okay. And now, can we return control? Yes, we can. Yeah. yeah. That's fine. Sorry about that. That's okay. No worries. So. Actually watching a little bit of those videos, it sort of set the stage and that was the intent to set the stage of what had actually happened and what transpired. So and that's what I sort of want to talk to you about is how we sort of dealt with this, again, critical loss of infrastructure. And uh, so as I was thinking about this and talking about with the resilient folks, uh, which one is this operating? All right, neither. Down, okay, I got you, got you. So anyway, as you have these kind of incidences and responses that you have to work through, these are not how you prepare for it, right? These are not strategic options of dealing with any kind of disaster or crisis situations. Uh, it's not a strategy, so, you know, but we do always want to prepare for the worst and hope for the best. That's the only time hope really comes into play in something like this, so as, the initial onset of a fire began, uh, you, you deal with sort of that fog of war, as I like to call it. You don't know exactly what's going on. You saw the news choppers, had TV news, radio news, everybody reporting that, you know, hey, there's a uh, issue going on. And we're not exactly sure of what's going on if it was uh, a terrorist issue. You don't know. I mean, things, when you start seeing this kind of fire and impact, you're trying, you know, you're running through your head, what is, what is this causing this? And so you immediately respond. And so as we started responding as the Department of Transportation, I'll talk about first responders in a minute, but we had to start doing assessment of what, where is this located at? We're getting these TV, you know, feeds from the aerial footage from helicopters. Where is this location? What is it that's burning? How, how is it that we're going to respond? What's going to be needed? All while this is happening. This is all during the event itself, I mean immediately. So uh, my first call, this is the inside baseball part, right? My first call was to the heroes. You guys have seen the yellow truck State Farm on the side, uh, uh, our highway assistance operators. Uh, our facility that houses those, where they're based out of, is under that viaduct, under that bridge, about a block up from Piedmont Road. And so my first thought was our building is on fire, and that's what we're seeing. So the first call was to the, the hero operator, a manager, to say, hey, is our building on fire? 
The answer was no, it's something very large, but it's nearby and we're, we're on our way now. Um, so my next call was to the CEO of MARTA, Armor Yard, their train yard is right next to the viaduct as well. And I just wondered if he had a train, some kind of train electrical fire that was going on and their offices are on down Piedmont. Uh, and so he said, no, but I can see the smoke from my window, it's not us. And so, you know, you start triaging, start finding out what it, it's going on. So I did what every investigative journalist in Atlanta did. I pulled up Google Earth and went to Street View. <laughs> so we sort of had pinpointed that it was on Piedmont Road. Our first thought was there was probably a tanker truck on fire under Piedmont, uh, under, under the bridge at, on Piedmont. But we go in and zoom in and we understand and I start seeing that there's uh, HDPE coils of conduit and uh, there. And I said, oh, I now know what's burning and why you're getting such a black smoke. You're seeing a petroleum fire. Now what caused it, we still don't know at the point. It's just a matter of how are we responding. And so uh, you get to that point of trying to assess. First things you have to do is really assess the situation, figure out you know, sort of what, where, and why is still a question mark at this point, so that you can start being responsive. Uh, the long and the story, short of the story is, I don't know if you've tracked in the media, but there was a, a crack deal that sort of went awry. Uh, we had, as the Department of Transportation, had a lot of spools of conduit, plastic conduit, that we use for running fiber optic cable through for our ATMS, ITS projects along the freeways. Uh, stacked up, stored in a chain link fenced off area, and uh, three people, again, had this sort of crack deal that went awry, and the one guy decided that he would show these people that he was going to set this conduit on fire and was pretty successful at it. Uh, you know, so these are learning opportunities, right? These are, you know, why did this happen? You know, we thought we had a pretty good deal of a place to store conduit, not having UV on it chain link fenced off, you know, thinking it's pretty secure. Our main part of security was for it not to walk off, for people not to steal it. Um, so uh, we actually joined with NTSB in a joint investigation. We asked our state fire marshal to do an investigation of policies and procedures for outdoor storage of su such conduit. And uh, also uh, the Atlanta Fire and Rescue Division, of course, was the lead agency on basically doing a uh, uh, fire investigation. So it was very important that we understand, you know, how this, how this happened. Or is our technology working? Okay, so we'll go back a slide and show you a video. Well, maybe not. Back. 
That's the Mari yard in the upper right hand corner. All right, traffic. Everything that's on everybody's mind. Now, I made a comment yesterday that this is kind of a big duh hub. You're looking at the proverbial cork in the bottom. You know, when you look at the spot of where this is occurred coming off the connector, you can expect that a permanent thing from now on is that northbound on 85 off the connector is going to be shut just as you see now. With, with the quality we all look for and demand in every project is outstanding. These folks came together, worked shoulder to shoulder for one common goal. Common goal is a quality project on time, and in this, in this case, we couldn't be happier. It's ahead of time. This is really an outstanding result. I do have some great news. As of rush hour next Monday morning, the Interstate 85 bridge will be completed and will be open traffic. I was happy that um, we were able to get everybody going and um, we, made, we made a difference here at the We chose to be on this project. It was obviously an honor for our company. We're very humbled to get the call and excited. Uh, our employees since day number one have just been excited to be part of this. Even the ones that have not been on the project day in and day out, we're just wanting to be a part of this. We know how big it is for the city, for the state. Yeah, we call this the thank you video to sort of the public, and I think it does a good job of capturing sort of the whole situation from initial collapse to obviously a, a great outcome of uh, success as you see it. Talked about these not being strategy, so let's move into uh, this notion that I, I can't emphasize enough the criticality in events like this and other events, whether it's natural disasters or not, the critical role that our first responders play in what they do. And I'm going to tell you that nobody would want to talk about this. I wouldn't be here today if there had been people killed or injured or, you know, been in a bad situation during the initial event itself. So very critical how our first responders played a, such a vital role in protection of, of life and property uh, of, of people. Believe me, uh, there's a lot of things. Uh, there was several videos like on face, Facebook or uh, social media where people were driving by as the flames are coming up over the bridge and I remember when one of them a lady was talking about oh my gosh it's so hot and I mean she could feel that radiant heat just coming in her vehicle but yet she was thinking that I'll just drive across this so uh, you know I don't know uh, so obviously no structural design classes she, she never had any structural design classes so um, the uh, you know again a little bit of the inside baseball story was when this was happening in the news, as I was talking about in the live shots from the, from the helicopters, I just had walked into my house and saw this on TV, and my first thought was that as hot as that fire is, you know, that, structure not, that structure's not gonna make it. And uh, within a few minutes, you had the initial collapse of one span going northbound. And just again, to give a little perspective is, uh, 85 carries about 243,000 vehicles per day. So, you know, 
you know, almost a quarter million people a day travel in this one corridor. Uh, but again, the first responders absolutely saved lives. Uh, they got traffic stopped uh, in all directions, under, over, and around. Uh, the firefighters responded to, again, they don't know, just like we didn't know, they did not know what was burning. In that video, you saw a foam truck, one of the foam uh, fire trucks from the airport, drove from the airport here to get foam on the HDP conduit, which basically is a petroleum fire, which burns very hot. Sorry, I don't remember off the top of my head how hot it burns, but it's, it's like five, 600 degrees. I mean, it burns extremely hot. So the first responders were honored by getting a trip to the White House. That's pretty awesome. Got invited to the White House. And I'm going to, I want to brag on them again because somebody made a decision that said, stop the traffic. Don't let any more traffic across or under. The president actually quizzed them on who made that call. He wanted to call them out. They would not give it up. And I, I even asked the colonel of the state patrol, I said, who, who made that call? Was it Atlanta Police Department? Was it one of your guys? Was it one of our hero guys? Who made the call? They said there's too much honor among all of them that nobody gets that credit because it's all a team effort. And that's pretty big. I mean, when the President of the United States is sort of asking who made that call, and none of them would, it's almost, you know, just an honor among all of them that, or a code of honor, rather, that uh, they didn't want to give that up. So just remember, these people put their lives in harm's way. Uh, I'm going to tell you a story about the firefighters. So again, they're spraying water. They're spraying water on this fire, petroleum-based fire, uh, superheating the water, turning it into steam. They're, they're spraying the bridge with water. Uh, you can see in this photo, I mean, they're, that's shooting over a Beaufort Spring connector. They're shooting water over one road to get to another. As they soak the concrete bridge, concrete deck, concrete beams, concrete columns, concrete's porous, right? So it's water soaking in. It's getting superheated which causes the concrete to basically, as the concrete gets superheated with that water in it, turns it into steam, stops the popcorn effect of concrete flying off. The firefighters tell us about how they were getting pelted with concrete. And when we got there that night, there was pieces of concrete, you know, an inch, quarter inch to a half inch to an inch, and maybe two or three inches laying everywhere. It's just like somebody shot it with a shotgun, just pieces of concrete laying everywhere. And they were physically getting pelted with that. The firefighters also heard the reinforcing steel and the tendons and the concrete beams, I'll, I'll talk about later, heard them eat, reach ultimate failure. Now, I don't know if anybody's a civil or has been in a materials lab. Anybody done that? You, have, you, have you broken a piece of steel, brought, brought it to a rupture point? It's loud, it's very loud. And so they are hearing all that, and the fire captain said retreat. And thank goodness they did, because they were physically under the bridge where the collapse happened. That's where the, that's where the material were. So can't say enough about our first responders. So, uh, and remember, it doesn't matter if it's this, a natural disaster, a hurricane, a tornado. They're always there first. You know, they're out with uh, power lines falling, wind blowing, those kind of things. Uh, it's amazing what they do. So let's get in a little bit more about how we responded in this, this instance. I talked to you about sort of that fog of war of our first thought processes, but while that was going on, we stood up our emergency operations center. And our emergency operations center is at our traffic management center, which is co-located right next door to the Georgia Emergency Management Agency, uh, which is over on uh, Confederate Avenue over by the zoo in that area. That's where our traffic management center is. That's where where they, sh they show you the live TV shots uh, for all our traffic cams and during weather events, that's where that's housed at. So we stood that up and had our, had our team, our te when I say team, the state team of the Georgia Emergency Management Agency, State Patrol, uh, MARTA, DOT, all come together because we knew MARTA was going to be critical as well as also a couple of our other of our transit providers. I had to immediately call the governor to say, Gov this is not a fun call, by the way. Governor, uh, a piece of 85 has fallen down and commuting is going to be very bad for a long time. That's all I know at this moment. And uh, not a fun call. Uh, but you have to make it. I needed the governor to declare a state of emergency because, you know, a quarter of a million cars a day, not being able to traverse that area is, uh, is a state of emergency. 
uh, from the traffic point of view. But also getting the state of emergency allowed us to get with our federal highway partners. Interstate 85 is obviously an interstate highway under control of the federal highway. So we had to notify our federal highway partner here in Atlanta. And getting that declaration of a state of emergency from the governor was able, to, we're able to get immediate funding requests from the federal government to help put this back together but also expediency in the process that you have to go through for permitting and approvals. Uh, so that was very important to get the emergency response status. Uh, again, uh, coming together at one central command center is very important. I think that's applicable no matter what infrastructure you're talking about. Uh, if it's power or water or transportation, having a central command center is very important. And we stood that up immediately. In fact, we use the same plan to stand this up as we do if we have that uh, stuff that falls from the sky when it's cold and it's wide. And it, I can't say the word. It's a four-letter word that begins with S. It ends in W. Or the, the other freezing precipitation stuff. We, we don't like to talk about that. But it's the same thing we stood up there or for hurricanes or for tornadoes. So we had a plan, and I think that's an important thing, is agencies and businesses have to have a plan for when things go wrong. How do you, how do you stand up? How do you get the right people there? And so here's the kind of people we have there. I mentioned GEMA, State Patrol. On the GDOT side, we had our maintenance folks, the maintenance operation people. We had our traffic operations folks who obviously run the operation center there. We had our communications team, and I'm going to talk about communications in a minute, very important. Sort of uniquely and differently, we had our bridge engineers there. Bridge engineers don't usually show up for winter weather when it's, you know, may snow. Uh, we had IT, believe it or not, uh, a lot of systems come into play, so we need to be able to make sure we have all access to all our systems in case something happens. Uh, we have our, our data people, transportation data people. Uh, that, have, that house our GIS folks, uh, very important for a reason, and I'll tell you that in a minute. Uh, we had City of Atlanta staff in bed with us from uh, police and from their transportation department. Uh, we had all our sea level staff, basically our deputy commissioner, our chief engineer uh, in there, uh, as well as Federal Highway. It was truly all hands on deck and our construction division because we're trying to, again, triage. So. Within an hour, within an hour of this event starting, this was already stood up. All these people around their respective tables at our command center, each doing what their subject matter expert is in triaging the situation as it was still going on, as the fire was still raging. And so it's pretty amazing that we were becoming actionable in what each of those groups needed to do, what their plan was in less than an hour. And I can tell you that I'm not sure that what the public response would have been if we waited to the next day and said, I think we'll get started, right? Not the kind of, that's not good for anybody, whether you're in public sector or private sector. You know, you got to be able to respond very quickly. And so we had to become what was actionable. So obviously the first actionable item was immediate traffic management. So I want you to look at this slide for a minute. Remember the amount of traffic. Uh, for you civil folks or transportation folks, you know, this section of 85 is a level of service D through F. You just name the time of day in the, in the afternoon and the PM peak that is very heavily congested. Again, uh, that's so much, that even underscores how much our first responders do, did to get traffic stopped. Uh, so one of the things that the immediate traffic response was to triage all the traffic. You know, where is traffic stopped? We obviously knew 85 in Piedmont, but as our uh, good old apps that we enjoy to use, you pick your app, whatever, Waze, Google, whatever you want to use, started rerouting people, the algorithms were having a hard time processing that. So it was gridlock. If you were here, you know it was gridlock. And so we immediately had to go into traffic management. So our TMC, our traffic management center folks were able to work on signal remotely, work on signal timing to try to un uncork some of those things, that's the Colonel of the State Patrol's word, I guess. Try to get things moving. Obviously, first responders and people on the ground, we had to go from this. Now look at, pay attention. If you can see which way cars are headed, you can see the, fire, you can see the water 
being uh, sprayed on the fire to this same location. You see the difference? <laughs> Everybody's going one way on that section of northbound. We had to get them all turned around to get them out of there because they couldn't cross. I mean, as you're not getting across a, that chasm that exists. Now, social media is great. I got all kind of friends that sent me the Hot Wheels orange loop that we should put in, the Dukes of Hazard jumping over it. I mean, I had all kind of suggestions of how to how to make this work. Uh, yeah, yeah, we need a big long steel plate. Uh, they're everywhere here in, in town. Uh, so anyway. Again, first, first response in triage is manage the crisis that's in front of you, which is the traffic impact and how do you get traffic dissipated. And obviously, uh, whoop, wrong way, that gets us into informing the public. There's nothing like getting thousands of media inquiries as, as just in a matter of an hour, just amazing of the media wanting to know you know, what happened, what's going to go on, and I'll talk about the media later. But it, we stood up our partnerships with each of those agencies I mentioned, and we had to have one central form of communication, and that's very important in any kind of, any kind of disaster situation, a response. You can't have different people saying different things. So our communications team, who was at the table, started working with each of the agency's communications to push out on social media one message, we directed everybody to the 511 call center or app if you have the app uh, and tried to message and we were telling the media, go, use, go to 511, we're pushing it out on one platform. We will deal with you individually as we have time, but we're still in triage mode. You know, this thing's still, this thing's still burning as the media is, you know, trying to get in and say what's going on. So this was very important. The other important thing I mentioned earlier about our data and our GIS people, you need somebody to quickly develop maps and detour maps to get out to the public. That was a lesson learned that we had from actually a hurricane where a lot of roads got inundated and we had to quickly try to give some maps and get some graphics out to people to easily understand where they need it. So we had our data people here, so they were quickly working on all the detours, working with the city, working with the state patrol saying, what are the detour routes, what routes are available and a very simple graphic such as this on the screen means a lot, right? Not try to give too many, not try to give too complicated, detailed information to people, but just enough. So, sort of again a lesson learned. Again, very important the immediate response. As we motive, as we mobilized, it was pretty obvious that we had one span of bridge that had been collapsed, and so we knew that was going to, have to be demolished basically and hauled off. What we didn't know was that what else, what other damage was done. So the same thing, immediate response, one of the first, probably I think it was probably the fourth phone call was to our bridge inspection team to say, hey, we need bridge inspectors on the scene and we need you now. And so we have, re we have bridge inspectors sort of stationed all around the state. They came back in. We had to get police escorts to get them through that traffic that you saw earlier. And one of our lessons learned was that we thought by, you know, 11 o'clock, this was again 6.30, 7 o'clock, we figured by 11 o'clock midnight we'd be out inspecting a bridge. We were wrong. Way too hot. Uh, sort of a neat story. Uh, there's a transmission, powered transmission. I understand Georgia Power is here. They had a transmission and a distribution line that goes right across where this fell. And so all of a sudden we see these Georgia Power trucks pull up. And this was probably at around midnight or so. And they had brought out their uh, drones, UASs. And so they're flying their power lines looking at the set load of how much smoke and stuff got on their, they de-energized their lines because of the heat. But they were inspecting their lines. So our bridge inspector said, hey, you know, can you fly into this site for us and let us see what we can see and, you know, get a head start because physically you couldn't get in there. Uh, it was interesting. They tried. They tried very hard, but too much heat, too much lift, they couldn't control their drones. It was that hot that even the drones couldn't get in there. Uh, it was so hot that the guardrail on Piedmont Road, there was some guardrail down there, and it was pretty much glowing red hot when we got there. Uh, they have some wood blocks that help hold the guardrails up. They were totally gone. <laughs> it was nothing left of those, and it was totally incinerated. So we couldn't inspect the bridge as fast as we wanted to. We had to pressure wash the bridge the next day so the bridge inspectors could do the work that they needed to do. And one of those things you hadn't, we hadn't prepared for, didn't think about, 
but had to get, get in there and inspect uh, about 700 feet of bridge. Uh, I actually inspected more than that. 700 feet of bridge we determined needed to be replaced, 350 feet on each side. We had one span collapse. One of these, again, inside baseball stories. That very night with the Georgia Power folks, we were standing under a span that was in bad shape that could have fallen, that had to be demol dem uh, demolished. But we were all standing under that, just didn't think it was, it would have been affected because it wasn't so close to the heat. But turns out it needed to be uh, demolished. So that night of the actual fire, the emergency response and the ER funds from Federal Highway and the, the uh, authority to start working on a project prior to all the permitting and regulatory things that you normally do was a big help because we're able to start talking to a contractor to say, hey, we need you to come in here and start demolishing this bridge as soon as you can get here. Actually, our first call was to say, hey, we need lights. We need to bring the light plants that you see at, when the contractors work at night. It's hard to see when you drive down the road. We need those because we need to light this thing up to inspect it. So we started that night, and the contractor actually started the next morning tearing down and start tearing out the part that had collapsed as we, as we uh, did our inspections. So uh, very, very good. A uh, little bit of things, too, that you think about and that you can't always plan for is, well, we wanted them to get to work very quickly. Again, as I said, it wouldn't have been a good news story is on the next day, there's nobody out there doing anything. You know, we're assessing, we're thinking about what we need to do. In fact, we were actually applauded by Federal Highway because they came to town next day from Washington, D.C., and they said, we can't believe you're already working. It's like, that's a no-brainer. That's laying in the ground. We've got to get that gone, you know. So that was pretty easy to get, get the contractor underway. Now, the contractor didn't have a contract. Now, I don't know if any of y'all have taken any contract law classes or anything like that. Most people like to work with a contract. Right? Like to know how you're going to get paid and how much you get paid and when you're going to get paid. Well, this contractor, we agreed that we did not know all the, we didn't know what was going to need to be rebuilt. They were capable of rebuilding the bridge. So we kept up with materials, time, labor. So we were able to document basically what they were doing, how much time they spent, how much labor was on the job, so we could ultimately negotiate a contract. They worked for eight days without a contract in place. We were able to negotiate a contract on basically the eighth day. And that was very, again, very critical to make fast decisions to get people working. Uh, you, time is of the essence. That's, that's in most every contract. If you start reading contracts and your attorneys read contracts, for, you know, write the contracts for you, time is of the essence. It really is in emergency situations. You've got to make those fast decisions. We have made other decisions, too, as it relates to our bridge design. On this slide, uh, the bottom right is our bridge design team that worked on, on this project. Many of those from this institution here. Great, a lot of great bridge engineers we have. Uh, so uh, they came in, as I said, that initial night. And you would think, a bridge falls down, we'll just go find the old plans and dust them off and we'll just rebuild that. Seems easy enough, right? Nothing's easy in this world, right? Yeah. Hope you figured that out by now. So there's nothing easy. Turns out that as we pulled out the old plans, we don't design bridges like that anymore. Uh, this, but things, time, things evolve and change, and so we needed to take a fresh approach. Obviously, time is the essence, so we knew high strength, high early concrete was going to be very important. And uh, so as we started looking at what we had, the bridge inspections came in. The bridge inspectors came in and said, this is what we have. This is what we can keep. Here's what we can't keep. Again, as it turns out, 350 feet, uh, basically three spans northbound, three spans southbound. And not easy because the first thing we looked at was the beam design that was on the existing bridge. Uh, nobody makes those type of beams anymore. They're uh, precast uh, or pre-stressed concrete beams. And uh, the shape that they make, and I'll show you a picture, we don't do any of those anymore. We quit making those. And to make things more complicated, uh, if I use the clicker in the right direction. The beams were one span on each side were trapezoidal in shape, which meant each beam was a unique design. If you're designing bridge beams, it's nice because usually they're all parallel, they're all the same length, and it works out really nice. You design one beam for that loading, and you're good. You can just, rep, just make four or five or 10 or 20 of those. But as luck would have it, this section of Piedmont Road goes under 
the uh, 85 at a different angle, so as a trapezoidal span. So our bridge design engineers had to start designing beams of different lengths uh, again. And I tell, I tell most lay people, it's like going to Home Depot and buying a two by four stud, they're all the same length. That didn't work. We had to make a unique cut for each one of those, if you would. So here's what we did. We came with a modern design of what beam manufacturers currently use, what we call Ashto bulb T-beam. Uh, these beams are very tall. Uh, very good, efficient beam. Again, precast, pre-stressed uh, beams. Uh, we, they were manufactured up in Smyrna by uh, a company there and also in Savannah. So uh, having beam manufacturer close by was very important. Uh, usually on these big beams, you don't see them driven around the city for our projects during the daytime. That happens in the wee hours of the night. But as soon as a beam was manufactured, had the right had the right uh, strength of concrete and was ready to leave that yard, it was delivered. It didn't matter what time of day or night, and it had a police escort. Uh, our beam manufacturer really liked those police escorts. They, they wished they could get those all the time. So uh, we actually had people on I-75 up in uh, Cobb County pull over and applaud as they went by one time. We don't usually get that either. We usually get a number one sign. Uh, so that was uh, nice to have. Other details, again, uh, 85 is 10 lanes wide at this section. Uh, we tried to implement everything we could to do things as fast as uh, possible uh, beside our normal cast in place type of construction. Uh, these cross members you see on the bottom are uh, what do we call diaphragms that give some lateral stability. We actually use steel. We typically use concrete that are cast in place and poured in place. Uh, and this we use steel and that sped things up. So again, anything we could do uh, from an efficiency point of view. And I'd have to say that with our bridge design team, uh, this was the truest design build model that I've probably ever seen. As our bridge designers came in on Thursday, got what they needed from bridge designers by, fr uh, I mean from bridge inspection, by really about Friday mid-afternoon, a full assessment of what needed to be done, they turned over a complete set of plans to the contractor on Monday morning about 12.05 a.m. It's kind of hours you guys keep studying and just getting started studying probably. That's late for me. Uh, but anyway, they, as they did design calculations, as they did design calcs and details, they sent them to the contractor electronically to say, hey, look at this. Do you see a constructability issue? Do you see a fabrication issue? Is there something here that's problematic that will cause delay? And they did that incrementally over Friday and Saturday and Sunday back and forth. Uh, we also learned that our heat and air doesn't work in our building after a certain time on the weekends. So not only were they working hard, they didn't have heat or air. It was very stale in there. Uh, but they did it. I'm so proud of them. Great, great team. Uh, so the substructure, we were very fortunate that the foundations were not harmed in this event. And so we were able to utilize the existing foundation. And in that video, you saw some columns that they were uh, working on. A lot of hand labor because we basically were able to encapsulate the old column, which had su significant delamination or the concrete falling off of the columns. They had to basically uh, get back to sound concrete back around the existing reinforcing steel, and then we oversized the column. And basically, again, put another round of re reinforcing steel on that column and able to come back up out of the ground. Tremendous amount of hand work. Some things the machine, big machines can, can't do. Uh, and then, again, as when we got these original plans, this is not our traditional type of design as we build bridges today. Uh, the uh, part that the beams sit on we call a cap and that's the support that holds the beams up and the transition from the beam to the column uh, is what was the inverted T because it looks like an upside down T. Uh, typically we just have a cap that uh, fits on top of a column that's not a T shape. Uh, tremendous amount of reinforcing steel, it's a very efficient design. Tremendous amount of reinforcing steel and again a constructability challenge. Uh, we ended up using smaller aggregate in the concrete so that we could get good encapsulation around all the reinforcing steel uh, and also obviously high strength and high early strength in the concrete. So that's a little bit about the technical details. But what we also knew while all this was going on on that weekend 
especially I was a little bit lucky that Friday was the first day of traffic in this new normal. But what we knew by Monday morning, Metro Atlanta was going to reach a new normal as it relates to uh, commuting. And we knew that transit was a very vital role of what that solution could be to backfill that quarter million people that no longer had access. So uh, we worked very closely. As I said, MARTA was with us. Our uh, State Road and Tollway Authority or the express system buses that you see, they were with us in the headquarters. We started planning very early on for what the new situation looked like. MARTA had to put on more train cars. Uh, they saw uh, overall use in transit during this entire time had an uptick to about 12%. I'll give you a little more details. A couple of other stations had greater than that. But MARTA, MARTA uh, excuse me, the express bus system in Gwinnett County Transit could no longer deliver people into midtown Atlanta and downtown Atlanta from the suburbs. What they did do was direct them to the MARTA heavy rail station over in Dorville. So they got out of Gwinnett to Dorville to get on rail to come downtown, which sort of makes a lot of sense. We, we've still been talking about that from a policy point of view. So uh, again, Working with, working with the uh, transit providers was very important. Also down in the bottom right corner, Georgia commute options. Our, what we do to publicize and encourage teleworking and telecommuting is very important. So if the more people that could stay home and work to get off the road would be very important. And obviously carpool, uh, that notion of carpooling, uh, try to, in, uh, to emphasize that as well. Again, though, I have to tell you, this again was a sort of a solidifying event that made everybody say, we really need to think more about transit options for Metro Atlanta, which is a very good thing. Uh, great partnerships with ride shares with Uber and Lyft. I know this slide is very bad, but Uber and Lyft both would offer a reduced fare, basically 50% of a pool, like an Uber pool, if, you were, if your destination trip was a MARTA station. <laughs> So this is one month of Uber data of how many people used Uber that went to a MARTA station. And I mean, look at it. It's pretty much all of Metro Atlanta. And so that's pretty awesome. Again, how many people can you get off the road into, into transit? So again, a great partnership of Uber and Lyft. I think, think Uber was first and Lyft matched it. So uh, that's a good thing. Always good for competition. So what did this traffic change and what does this impact look like? Well, people listened. They took transit. We saw a 7% reduction in traffic along the entire region. So as you, if you look at the regional map, and I, I know this may be hard to read, but let me give you some details. The detour, which was basically 285 and 75 and I-20, saw a 128% increase in traffic volume in the first few days. Uh, the average of all the detours was about 10.5% increase in vol volume. But those first couple of days, significant increase. Again, overall volume, 7% reduction. But here's the thing that really changes. So travel time increased range from 33 to 42% above normal. So think about that. Travel time, 33 to 42% increase in travel time, even though you got 7% less people out there on the road. So. Uh, needless to say, patience was getting thin. You can see the red boxes, 13% uh, increase, 11% increase, 10% increase in volume uh, along 285. So uh, very big. This is my highly detailed traffic analysis screenshot from my phone one day at 535 when I decided I would leave the office to go home. Uh, and you can see it was red everywhere. I mentioned our our technology, our apps. I, I personally like Waze, not a personal endorsement, but a lot, you know, whatever app you like, traffic app you like. These first days, the algorithms couldn't keep up. So it became very interesting, the, the dynamic, the social dynamic, as traffic started getting distributed through neighborhoods, subdivisions, and local streets, which is not good. People are smart. So the people that lived in neighborhoods started saying road closed on their apps to keep people out of their neighborhoods. And so that was very interesting uh, to see how people responded, right? I, I, I live north of the city. I went home almost a different way every day. It was crazy. But when you see this kind of, when you see this, people's patience wear thin. So getting the work done was very important, again, as quickly as possible. Again, trying to improve the commute, though, using technology. 
We have regional traffic operation plans, basically where we're able to control traffic signals across jurisdictions so that we can maximize the flow and to maximize the efficiency of the tra traffic signals on the main corridors. And so we're able to remotely work on those and work on signal timing uh, re remotely there from Traffic Management Center as well as the city of Atlanta. So we deployed technology to, be, to get the most efficiency out of the existing corridors we can. And despite my objection sometimes to say, I think we need to go get a police officer down there to help them out. And they're like, no, 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 as soon as you do that, you're gonna mess up the next signal and the progression from signal to signal. So I was like, okay, you got it, right? And they did. And we saw, we saw tremendous gains, uh, a, lot, a lot of uh, higher, or what we call arrival on green as traf if traffic gets their signals on green. Uh, obviously more delay on some side streets, but we moved a lot more people efficiently. Let me talk about this next. And I don't usually say in partnership with the media, any media here, that's good. So we'll talk about them. What we talk about with the media is you have to message, message, message. As I said, that first night, thousands of in media inquiries and from everywhere, from even the BBC. I mean, it was like, wow, BBC. So, you know, CNN's local, we don't think about them too much, but national news, local news, everybody wanted to know what's going on. So that, after, that evening, as you saw, 6.30, 6.40ish, we knew that we had to get out to the public and message to the public. One, first thing is life safety, right? First thing we had to message is nobody got hurt. There's still people in traffic at this time at 11 p.m. So we said we had to get out to the 11 p.m. news cycle and talk about safety first. And that was our message because we did not have a full assessment at the 11 o'clock news cycle on that Thursday evening. We still didn't have an assessment of what's going to happen. We had a span of bridge laying on the ground, which obviously is a, as our, my good friend, the Colonel of the State Patrol says, the no duh huh. He can say that. He wears a gun every day. I can't tell the media that. Uh, they would have fun with that. So we got out to the media and started messaging life safety kind of things. And that's the kind of thing you have to do first. And what we did the next day, his no duh huh comment came the very next day at the noon news cycle. So their strategy at when do you deliver information to the media. And we were very controlled in that because as soon as we give an interview to one news station at you know 8 a.m., they're running with it and the other ones don't have it. And the media, any communications folks, media communications time? Okay. Anyway, interesting group of people. Very interesting group of people to work with. They probably say the thing about, same thing about engineers, but it's okay. But you have to, you have to work with those relationships. Uh, P, PR, we say, is not public relations, but personal relations. And they all have personal relationships, and they're all out trying to scoop each other up. So, you know, I, I need a little bit more tidbit of information than the next guy got or the next lady got. It's an interesting dynamic. But strategy in our communications through this whole event, I want to lay that out for you because it was very strategic in nature. Most people don't think about that. And I think this may, beside the quick rebuild and the great job that our engineers and contractors did, this is one of the things I'm almost, most proud of is how we dealt with the media and uh, it was strategic in nature. So the next day we got out with the whole team. We had MARTA, we had the fire chief to go through what happened, what's their assessment, you know, everybody's safe. We had the state patrol saying traffic's gonna be, a, you know, not gonna be good, you know, find alternate routes. We gave an assessment. Uh, MARTA gave an assessment of, hey, come to MARTA, we're ready for you. We're gonna, you know, we're increasing trains. We're going to be there to help you if you hadn't ridden, rid, ever ridden MARTA. We're going to have somebody at the station to help you. So we started messaging what people, you know, questions probably were going to be. And so we thought we were doing pretty good. And uh, so as you see what they call the scrum, uh, you see the bottom right of the TV cameras and what have you. You can't even imagine the, the top left corner how many cameras were there. Uh, you know, the questions started coming, well, how could you let this happen? This is your fault. And it became a blame game very quick. And you know, our gears are, how do we get a bridge rebuilt as fast as possible? You know, we're, the, the fire, the whole autopsy of what happened was not really on our radar at that time. So the media got very uh, negative very quick about, you know, it's gotta blame somebody. Somebody has to be at fault. How could you have stored material that could burn under a bridge? Well, we said, well, why do you have a, the same material in your refrigerator, in your cupboards, and all over your house? And your gasoline in your gas can at home is in the same kind of material. 
It doesn't burn unless somebody ignites it. So, you know, but they, they don't want to hear that. So we knew this thing that, that was brewing with, you know, why did you let this happen? We had it address. And so the way to address it is playing offense with the media. So we called a press conference of which I had our chief engineer, had our construction engineer, and had our traffic operations engineer and myself to go through, and we scripted it all out, to hit every ugly question we could think of. And we, I mean, we sat there and had our, had our media folks say, if you're a reporter, what's the ugly question you're going to ask? We want to hit it head on because we have nothing to hide. You've got to be transparent. So we went through that and did that press conference. That's why my ugly picture is down there in the bottom left. It looks like a deer in headlights. Ugh. Again, TV cameras like you won't believe. You ever watch the news now when you see the president or somebody important, you hear all those clicking, all those camera shutters? That's very distracting, by the way. Uh, you're trying to talk to somebody and you get all these clicks. But anyway, uh, so we, we handled that. And we got through that press, press conference and had hardly any questions. I was like, yeah. And then we get the question, again, the one we didn't think of is, how is Georgia DOT dealing with the homeless in Metro Atlanta? Because you let this happen because you had not taken care of the homeless population. That's a hard question to answer. So we had to start thinking about how we message and how we deal with that. So again, but the strategic part, again, as we advanced the construction was the media was just clamoring all over. I mean, they were trying to sneak into the work site and get video, you know, uh, all those kind of things. So we said, here's what's going to happen. We're going to give you a daily update of what happens on the project. And then every week, we're going to invite you into the project itself. We'll let you come in and get footage. And we're going to let our director of construction, who you saw in the video, give you a weekly update of the progress we made and what's to come. We wanted to flood them with information because that way they're not knocking on our door all the time, you know, asking for interviews. It worked very good. It worked very well. And they were, uh, it's sort of funny, as we got toward the end, uh, the thing became, well, you built this so quick, it can't be safe. And I told the reporter, I looked, him right in the I looked at the camera right in the eye, I said, you guys have been here 24-7 videoing this with drones, with cameras. It's the most inspected bridge we've ever built. I assure you that. You know, and they're like, well, I guess that's so. We've been here the whole time. <laughs> so, you know, I sort of cut them off there. So, anyway. Sort of interesting. The other part of the strategy that our communications people did was very, very smart. This is the secret. Don't tell anybody. We would schedule those press events on site just before, just enough time in advance that they could edit the footage, chop it up, do what they need to do to it, and get it to the studio or for the live shot for the 5 o'clock news cycle. Just in time. Not enough time to go interview the transportation experts that always go to QT and fill up with gas. That's the transportation expert. If you're in the media, that's where you go to get your, your, your uh, sound bite and your video of what do you think. It's always at QT. They like QT, I guess. I don't know. So, and they're always experts because everybody has a driver's license. So you're a transportation expert. So that's what they do. So the other thing we did was tee up big announcements. So they would, they would bring me in by default of this job if we had some good news to announce. And then anything that got bigger, we, we gave that to the governor. So there was a strategy of sort of escalating progress and uh, moving things ahead to the media. And again, tremendous outcome with that. Social media, talking to, you know, I'm not used to talking to college students in most of my presentations, but you know the power of social media. Uh, we saw a tremendous increase in Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Instagram grew by 45%. Uh, hashtag, you know, I-85 rebuild, web page. We had a lot of hits. I mean, it was a really a great way to get information out and put information out the way you want to put information out, too, and sort of controlling the media. Again, all this resulted in a, in a positive outcome. You saw in the video that the governor announced on May 10th that we'd have the project open uh, really early, ahead of schedules, uh, about five weeks ahead of our original schedule. So 42 days later, we removed 13 million pounds of old bridge, rebuilt 13 of the columns, uh, fabricated, hauled, and installed 61 of those beams that I talked about, poured 2,100 cubic yards of concrete, 
By the way, one of the things we thought about was shrinkage cracking and cracking of concrete. We figured if the media is out there with cameras, as soon as they saw a crack in concrete, they're going to go crazy. So we made sure that we used a lot of uh, some admixtures to make sure we didn't have cracking uh, of any concrete. Uh, so, uh, and then an estimated 54,000 man hours worked out there with, by the contractor. Um, I'll tell you this story too, another inside baseball story, is when we sat down to negotiate, before we sat down to negotiate with the contractor, uh, I went over and met with the governor and said, Governor, this is how much we think it's going to cost. This is how long I think it's going to take. And uh, so, just to let you know, and uh, he said, well, that's good. He said, is there, sort of lean back, and said, is there any way to incentivize them to get it done quicker? Like a business, you know, is there any business principle that you can incentivize the contractor to do it quicker? And, uh, and uh, you, I hope y'all can appreciate this. I'm sitting, he's sitting at the head of the table. I'm sitting at the corner, and I sort of lean in a little bit and say, well, Governor, we are shrewd negotiators. We're not going to give the contractor a dime more than they deserve. And we're not going to give them a day more than they deserve. I mean, we're, we are shrewd negotiators. And he looked at me and he said, well, Russell, I fully expect that, but is there a way you can incentivize them to get it done quicker? And I said, I'll work on that, Governor. Thank you. <laughs> and so we ended up applying basically a road user cost, a daily road user cost, to come up with what a bonus, if you would, or an incentive would be for any day's the work was done earlier. When you take 243,000 cars a day, there's different daily road user costs for cars and trucks. You can take the detour length and the distribute traffic along which way you think they may detour and come up with an analysis. We did that analysis. It varied anywhere from 800,000 to a million dollars a day in direct road user cost, time and money of vehicles and people. And so we said, well, okay, that gives us a starting place. So then we started looking at the value of the work, which the value of the work was about $15 million of the bridge. So we started looking at what can we do, what does that look like? So we came up with an incentive, basically, if they could beat some milestones. Uh, the milestone, we had a, basically a three-tiered process. The biggest milestone was to beat uh, Memorial Day because Memorial Day weekend's a big traffic weekend. So there was a big value there if we could get done before then. And they achieved that. They received a $3.1 million bonus. The contractor will tell you that that made all the difference. They worked 24-7 to the point that they couldn't work 24-7 anymore because they were either waiting on concrete to cure or something that you, know, you just couldn't be out there working on. Uh, and it made a difference. They said they probably would have worked 16 hour days, uh, 12 to 16 hour days, but the bonus they worked 24 7 to get it. Uh, again, $3.1 million. When you do that, road, when you apply the road user cost to the weeks ahead of schedule, that was a $27 million savings to travelers that were using the detour. So that was a very good return on investment when you look at it from that point of view. Uh, again, on the video you saw, uh, we're very honored on May 18th, which was after we opened it. Uh, we opened on May 12th and May 13th. Um, opened one As soon as they could be open, we opened the road. But we had a USDOT Secretary Elaine Chow come down, very nice. She was uh, very nice to say those kind of words. It was a really big deal. We had the ribbon cutting ceremony on the exact location of where the conduit burned. Pretty, pretty, neat, pretty neat thing. So I know this is a little bit more about transportation. Your class is a little bit more about transportation. So I just want to highlight a few things about preparing for the unknown that I think apply to any incident. Is the partnership, partnerships are really key to success, especially between state and local governments. And this applies to the business sector as well. You gotta have those, you gotta have those partnerships. The time of the emergency is not the time to figure out who your partner is or who, who is it that you call. Pretty much all those contacts that we were making initially were all by text or phone. You know, we don't have time to send an email. You know, we get, it's all, it's all got to be very quick. You have to develop processes, procedures, and protocols and then adapt. Our processes and procedures and protocols were all based on inclement weather response of how we respond in hurricanes and tornadoes and snowstorms or ice events. So we had that protocol in place in that procedure but we had to adapt. We had to bring bridge engineers in. Like I said, they don't usually come to uh, winter weather events. So we had to bring them in and we had to adapt. Making informed and quick decisions. I can't emphasize that enough. 
you'd be surprised at how paralyzed people get when the pressure is on them to make a decision. You're going to have to make decisions. And this, this, this is really a, I mean, I'm telling you, I see extremely smart and talented people when it gets down to you really got to make a go, no-go decision that, ugh, you know, you got to make those decisions. And we had a great team that did that. I'm not saying nobody did that. But if we had waited, if we said we're not sure, let us figure out if there's another design. I will tell you this. We did think about how can you rebuild this back other than rebuilding it back as is. Is there, is there a temporary bridge? Is there a big long metal plate somewhere that we can put over that? We, we looked for our other projects that had beams that were already made because we knew built, uh, designing and constructing beams was a critical path. So we said, hey, up on I-75 in Cobb and Cherokee County, how many beams are up there? Can we use those down here? And, you know, we, and we said, maybe can we build a mechanically stabilized earth wall and just fill that whole thing up and come back and stage build it later back the way we want it. We, we, you know, we, we went through an exhaustive list. But you got to make quick decisions. The quick decision was we just need to build this thing back, build it back right, not have the traffic, you know, traffic messed up for a year or more when you build the things in stages or temporary or build one side and what we call contra flow. We thought about building one side, put traffic over there, you know, in the morning and the afternoon, reverse commute it while we built the other side. Just too complicated. It was like we need to just get in and get out. Uh, communications, I, I talked so much about communications, dealing with communications team, super important. Uh, playing offense with the media, can't emphasize that enough. Uh, and really a resilient state DOT, and you can put any company or name in there, we have to learn from each experience. We had to triage, we had to learn, and we sat down and did a post office debrief. We brought everybody in that was associated with it. Every, even from construction inspectors to bridge engineers, we brought everybody back to the table and said, hey, what went good? What didn't go good? What should we do next time? Learned a lot of good things. Um, tracking, tracking information became one of our biggest takeaways. We have some pretty good database tools, but how do you communicate and how do you track information? Uh, when there's so many things going on, uh, communication is key, and that's one of the things that we know that we have to improve upon ourselves. Also, we have to develop a response for offices that are not traditionally engaged, like even our bridge engineers, our traffic operation engineers, they're not usually on call for, uh, you know, the guys that actually run the signal timing. They, they don't usually get engaged in the hurricanes and inclement weather, but they were here. So we need to make sure that each office has sort of that on call, who's responds in an emergency situation. But I couldn't be more proud of our team. People showed up. We had a lot of people show up. Those bridge engineers, they just came in. Nobody called them. They said, this is bad. We know we're going to be involved. They showed up. So I've got one quick little uh, fun video. Wish we could build it all of them that fast, and that's the you know you set some expectations. You do something quick, so every time we do a bridge replacement project, can you do it as quick as you did 85? The answer is no. <laughs> it's not sustainable. 
uh, too hard on our employees, the contractors' employees. They'll tell you that they were at the, they were at the breaking point. Uh, only one workplace injury, and it was a minor hand injury, just a cut, not, nothing serious. So that was very important to working very quickly, working 24-7, uh, working at night is very difficult. So those are the kind of results you want, things you think you never see, a billboard that thanks uh, DOT for what they did. Uh, those are the kind of things you want. So hopefully uh, always prepare yourself for the worst and hope for the best. That's the best strategy. And as you talk in your class about more of the systems, uh, you know, all, all kind of systems have such an impact on society, uh, water, electricity, transportation, you name it. Uh, you know, you got a good case study with Atlanta with the, with the airport, with the, with the fire they had there and the, the lack of redundancy and those kind of issues. I mean, those kind of things have huge impacts. Again, 243,000 people impacted every day. Uh, that's no small feat. Uh, and so, anyway, as you go forward, as you learn from this class, again, you know, prepare, run the, run the traps on what do you think can happen. You know, we certainly have been thinking about things more on a system-wide basis now, too. We actually have detour plans for, like, all interchanges. If there's an accident between an interchange, how do you detour and all those kind of things? But we don't have a system. You know, if this section of a system goes out, it's a big impact. So those kind of things we have to think about. One of our one of our friend states, Colorado, has actually done some risk analysis on an entire I-70 corridor. Uh, they found some problems with resiliency due to flooding, due to snow melt, and so they uh, they're trying to take on those things. So it becomes a real world condition when you look at resiliency as it relates to all kind of events. So uh, anyway, hope you enjoyed it. Uh, don't tell my secrets. Keep this among our fr among friends. Okay and uh, wish you all the best. I'll be glad to take questions. Right. Thanks. I think there'll be a great deal of questions. Okay. And as long as you're prepared to stay, as long as we have questions, we greatly appreciate that. I can, I can do about 10 minutes oh, okay. before I get to my next, next meeting. Yes. Okay, so when they started clearing the next day, did we know what started the fire? Uh, maybe. We did not personally. The Atlanta PD and Atlanta Fire and Rescue did. I didn't show it, but somebody actually snapped a photo of when the fire initially had happened and actually had seen the suspects, the three suspects. So they had a lead. They didn't know who, but they had a lead that they were actively investigating. Obviously, they didn't talk to us about that. Uh, who took the lead in that was Atlanta PD, Atlanta Fire and Rescue, but obviously the NTSB got engaged very early, and, uh, and the way that sort of works is we're, we're a partner agency. We, we could join the investigation with them, of which we wanted to, so we joined with them. We did uh, immediately salvage what parts of the conduit were left for testing and analysis, so they did a lot of physical testing on the conduits and, you know, determining the chemical makeup, accelerants, and all those kind of things. And to be fair, I have not seen, and I don't know that the final report has been released. Uh, I have seen the draft of the NTBS, NTSB investigation, the state fire marshal investigation, and basically uh, we were cleared from, you know, did you have the stored stuff stored properly? Yeah, we did. There was nothing that, there was no rule or prohibition against storing this material in this situation under a bridge. If it had been in a building or a warehouse, then there are certain rules and, uh, that, and regulations, fire regulations that apply, but nobody said, well, you know, nobody would have guessed this. And again, it would be there today if somebody hadn't caught it, caught it on fire. Yes, sir? With the ease that it did, though, has that changed a lot of the protocols surrounding the storage of things around Oh, yeah, yeah, you bet. And uh, on the second day, I did a memo uh, to an organization that covers all the transportation agencies in the nation. And we did a memo to say, hey, here's, what, here's the material, ASTM gave all the numbers, here's what we had stored under your bridges. Obviously, this is a threat, <laughs> pretty clear it's a threat. And we sent that out, and uh, I mean, you wouldn't believe the kind of response I've got from other DOTs that have found all kind of things stored under bridges. Now, think about it, though. You go to urban areas, 
There's buildings under bridges. Go to Chicago. Go look at Chicago. It's different levels. So there's a lot of things that are combustible or flammable under bridges. But HDPE, uh, one state let me know that they store all their barrels, all their barricades under their bridges because guess what? They're out of the weather, out of the elements, don't have to worry about the UV and it's the same material. So they had to rethink that. So there was actually a nationwide lesson learned in this that people started saying, what do we have? Immediately, that's one of the media questions. Well, how do you assure us that there's nothing else like this in Georgia? We immediately went and started looking under all bridges. And uh, there's, you find all kinds of things under bridges that you don't know is there sometimes, including a skate park. Maybe I don't know if y'all saw that, but we had a little skate park being constructed under the same bridge a little further down the street. Yes? It somewhat went back, re regrettably. Uh, we were hoping that people, you know, that the, Marta, the new MARTA customers would stay MARTA customers. I, I didn't give you the numbers. A couple stations went up by about 40 to 60 percent increase in daily activity. MARTA also had to uh, get additional parking, lease additional parking, because of the onslaught of people coming in, which was good. We were hoping that that would, you know, change some patterns. Uh, they have not seen a sizable increase, uh, regrettably. Um, the road, road network is just one part of the transportation system, so you talked about MARTA. So I know in Georgia for decades we've talked about transit from Macon to Athens and Augusta to Atlanta. What is it that prevents us from using the existing rail that is there to have um, trains like you do in Washington, D.C.? Right. You stop in Springfield, yep. Virginia, you park there. And mm -hmm. You don't drive into the city, right. but here everyone drives and everyone stops on I-75 out of your back. Uh, my, my opinion is two things, well maybe three things. Uh, one is funding, it's got to be subsidized hugely. Uh, private rail, uh, if money could be made by NS and CSX in, in passenger, they'd be doing it. So somebody's got to subsidize it heavily. Uh, we don't have that. The other thing is sprawl. We, uh, e I mean, Midtown is changing, right? I mean, your campus is changing, across the streets changing. We're getting that density now that's going to drive that to be more and more critical. But as the region goes, it's so spread out and we don't necessarily have that density. And I'm going to tell you, in Atlanta, this is personal opinion, it's on the camera, y'all don't tell anybody, parking's cheap. You can park anywhere around here, right? I got my, I got my Paygo app, what's it called? Parking your parking spots out here. But parking's cheap. So until the premium becomes, but if you see what's going on in Midtown and right around Tech Square over there, you're seeing parking being part of the development, part of the, you know, not surface parking lots anymore as part of the, as part of the high rise building. Uh, those kind of things I think influence people's behavior to make them get out of that. But uh, as traffic continues to grow, Georgia grew about 12% in traffic volume over 2013 to 2016. We're still growing about the same pace or a little faster than most of the southeast in the nation, usually around 2% or so a year. Uh, that people, you got to get to where people just don't want to sit in it anymore too. But you got to provide that option. So to answer your point, uh, though, we are working pretty closely on Atlanta to Charlotte, which has some possibility. Uh, that is a pretty good financial model long term. Uh, we are looking at Atlanta, Ch Chattanooga, not a high user demand. Atlanta to Jacksonville looks like it has some promise too. Now I'm going to tell you, all those things I talk about is not a very quick thing. Uh, there's a very good business model that's working in Florida right now, just started about a month or two ago. It's called the Bright Line. It's a, uh, they're running passenger rail that ultimately runs from Miami up to uh, Orlando, up to Coco and then across. Totally privately funded. <coughs> good business model. The people that run it own the railroad. But they figured out in, in Orlando, to Miami, uh, what they want to do, their business, their business case is too far to drive, too close to fly. They're trying to hit the business that, hey, if I can get on a higher speed, which is under 90 miles an hour, if I can get on a higher speed train and get there quicker than I can drive and I don't have to worry about driving and it's much cheaper than flying, I'm going to do that. And so that, believe it or not, the demographics of Miami Orlando, the population, the distance and everything is almost exactly the same as Atlanta and Charlotte. So I'm optimistic that they're looking at a private venture that way. Uh, so that one may come on pretty soon, but that's ver very important. Metro Atlanta's got to get there.
Yes. That is a very real it's conversation. Very high right. As a consequence right. of this fire. Right. And given the fact you replaced a simply supported girder with another simply supported girder, ninety percent of our bridges in the state are like this. Mm -hmm. All what it takes failure in one location mm -hmm. when structure becomes unstable. Right. We actually we actually had gone back and looked at some NCHRP work uh, and uh, that was looking at those risks. And, the, and we studied, we looked at it pretty hard. And the answer to your question, the ultimate answer to your question is, I don't know. Something that we still have to consider, again, low probability, high risk. That study that we looked at, and it was, it wasn't too old. I mean, it was dated, you know, probably four or five years. Uh, basically came to the conclusion was the cost wasn't worth the probability. And, but those are things you have to think about. Because you're right, in Atlanta, the other one was up at 285 and 400. Tanker, uh, tanker, fuel tankers are, whew, they're high, high risk business. So, but those are things that we still have to consider. Uh, that's one of the things we talked in uh, NTSB about as well. Is, is there anybody else doing this? And the answer we got was no. So, very good point. Yeah. Was there any labor model, bottleneck? I, I'm surprised that the contractor could mobilize and get 24 by 7. Today we're in effectively a right. full employment economy. Right. So we have the same problem today. It might be a little tighter. At least. Can you talk about the sure. question? That was that was one of the considerations was who could do the work and not have other projects suffer. And it turns out that their contractor was CW Matthews, they're based out of Marietta, so they're a Georgia firm. They had available labor that they were uh, they were transitioning from one job to another. Uh, and they had bridge, they had bridge, bridge uh, crews available, and that's one of the things that said they told us. They said, "Look, we can work on this." I'm like, well, "What about my other jobs?" They're like, "Yeah, we're we're okay." Now there was a there was a disruption in productivity from the bean manufacturer because they stopped making all the other beans that we may have been consuming in and around Atlanta. We're the big we're the biggest user of, of those type of uh, beams, uh, so we've had some other projects delayed because of that. That's fine. We'll deal with those. We don't have, you know, 243,000 cars a day waiting. So uh, they were able to do that. Uh, I don't know if it happened today, if we'd be in that same situation. I, I doubt it. And that's, those are, real, those are real concerns you think about that are, you know, ancillary to the immediate concern, but have bigger Im implications, you know, sort of globally. And was there any discussion, since you're rebuilding a bridge, of putting in modern technology in the form of sensors or something like that that wouldn't be the whole, obviously mm -hmm. the whole I-85, but for that section, 700 yeah. feet or whatever, would be forward looking in terms of sensor technology. I'm afraid we didn't. <laughs> I'm afraid we didn't. We, we certainly uh, look to use sensors and try to look for efficiencies where we can and usually it's post, though it's post uh, or modification of bridges with sensors and to get loadings and what have you, but we certainly didn't. We were, we were laser focused on getting it back open. Yes, sir. You mentioned the navigation algorithms being thrown off. So given the huge dependency between traffic flows and navigation apps, is there a process of communication between GDOT and say Google and Apple mm -hmm. to push critical information in a case of disaster and like how willing are they to collaborate? Uh, they were pretty willing, we, and we actually did collaborate. It was that sort of that an initial onset that where that happened. We, we actually are data sharers with Waze, which is obviously owned by Google. Uh, Apple, I don't know that I can speak to Apple. I think we, I'm pretty sure we coordinated with Apple. Uh, but we certainly, we have a data sharing agreement. What they, what they really like, and this is awesome for us, is they really like our construction information that we put out uh, to the media, and, and on 511, you can go out and look for future construction. So if they can get that and get that loaded in 
to their maps and their apps, then they can guide you in and around that. We like that to get people out of construction zones, but also they, it's good messaging. What we get out of it is we get coverage of where we don't have cameras or our heroes to get good data that there is an accident or there's a pothole or there's something going on. And, and they're, they, they're pretty savvy in their, uh, how they uh, get to that, get that, you know, they get, when you get something popping up on your, uh, your app that says there's traffic or there's a, uh, uh, you know, uh, somebody on the shoulder or what have you. I don't like the police ones, by the way, that's bad. Don't, don't say there's police out there, it's not good. Don't push that button. Uh, but it, we have a good data sharing agreement that's trying to be more robust. So, uh, you know, it's big data, it's good stuff. Yeah, uh, no, you know, we're dealing with businesses that are losing customers <laughs> because they can't get there. And we had a, we had a big issue on Piedmont Road uh, and uh, a lot of those corridors around there, Monroe and that whole area where people avoided them and the normal customers uh, got out of there. So trying to do some kind of customer road user cost uh, charge to get through there would not have been politically uh, politically popular. I had a question way over here. So that's our first responders uh, out there with blue lights and guns saying we're going to turn you around. So and that's a that's hard. I mean you're in confined spaces so there takes a lot of command and control out there to say you first, you next and you know everybody's wanting to get out of there. They were stuck there for hours. People, the, the, yeah, so people started backing up for a long way, so it was a, uh, it took hours to get those around, but it's those first responders out there that can get it done. Those guys and ladies know how to get it done. So, all righty. One more question, yes? Yeah. So it was uh, being able to negotiate and talk to several of them, uh, and actually the very night that it happened, we just we decided who we could use again. They talked about their availability. They could they could be there to that evening. They could start demolition the next morning. If you saw the saw them chomping at the concrete, which was a subcontractor, they had all those things lined up. Where other people said we're going to have to get we're going to have to make some calls. We're going to have to get back to you. You know, a lot of contractors won't work without a contract for good reason. You know, those are and they thought look we know you're going to have to figure this out. You know, you'll be fair. We'll sit down and negotiate. You know, we pr we protected the state's interest though too. Of, you know, we were ticking off how many people are out there, and you know, and how how many how many pieces of equipment, and you can get operation rates and those kind of things. So we we want to make sure we know we were not taken advantage of. But they they did. They did a fantastic job. But that was a big big thing to get it going very quick. Yes, sir. You obviously couldn't pre-plan a whole lot for this, but there was some at least indirect pre-planning. Available. For example, you very quickly reprogrammed the traffic lights mm -hmm. so that you could work both the immediate and the longer term traffic situation. I don't know if you had any other planning. I mean, it's sort of hard to see how you could plan for such an intense right. but highly localized kind of thing. But on a, on a different scale, uh, if we had an event here that was, let's say, an order of magnitude worse with regard to traffic that would require a serious evacuation, or you'd have a refugee probably had a seismic event or some very toxic chemical explosion or what have you. Have you put together, not just in Atlanta, but perhaps other places in the state, do you have plans in place that can kick in when something like that happens and that can be quickly adjusted to the particular location? We have, we, we and I say we is through GEMA, have some very strategic plans for events of how do you handle them. Not necessarily if this happens, do this, but more protocol. I think the biggest example, and this you know is a good case study, is was snowmageddon back in 2014. If you were here, that was a great event of a mass exodus of Atlanta. It wasn't the snow or the ice that caused the problems. It was the traffic initially, and we saw we saw. 
everybody left at the same time. So a normal rush hour in Metro Atlanta really spans probably three hours on the shoulders, maybe more depending on where you are. It, when traffic distributes, uh, distributes over time because people come and go at different times, but when you ask everybody to leave, there's a little bit of old, old uh, traffic analysis that says for every minute you're stopped, it takes three to four to sort of get unstopped. So if you take, if you take what happened in 2014 and everybody left at one time and that's usually a three hour event and you do three or four hours, we'll go to four, three times four is 12 and that's what it came out to be. It became a 12 hour traffic event with ice in the middle. And so you can't evacuate, in my, my personal opinion, you can't evacuate a metropolitan city the size of Atlanta orderly and successful. People do what they do. You know, there's staggered times, but the lessons we learned from that, though, was the coordinated efforts with the governor's office, GEMA, the school systems, the city, Fulton County, DeKalb County, state government, that we very much are strategic about go, no go, or in the last, no, the last uh, event we had that we actually staggered uh, what the city did, what the Atlanta Public School did, and what state government did. And that worked pretty good. But you can't, you got to prepare ahead of that and start messaging ahead. And on weather events, it's very difficult. We're, you need to make decisions usually about three days ahead of ahead to have all your resources ready on a changing forecast. Same thing with Hurricane Irma. We were deployed to the east side of the state, ready to go. Guess what? It wobbled and wobbled and wobbled. It came up the west coast of Florida and then came up through Valdosta and up the middle of the state. We had to redeploy people. So you, you're having to make decisions, but you got to have those. You got to have sort of those practices. But it's hard to it's hard to say if you know something happened in downtown and you need to evacuate downtown midtown. How do you do that? Um, it's it's just a, it's a capacity issue, you know. And people, again, you can say if you know if you're on an odd number or even number, if your zip code's this or you know, your office is in this quadrant, you leave at this time. When, uh, when your child is at school, people are going to get their kids no matter what. You know, now I'm not going to wait till they tell me to wait. I'm going to get my kid right now. So it's, a, it's an interesting social dynamic. But, but we, uh, GEMA does have, we do, we do as a state, we do a lot of desktop, uh, or we do a lot of desktop uh, uh, practice of scenarios. And we, a we actually plan for that. National Guard's involved in that as well. Didn't need National Guard on the bridge but we involve them on uh, other disasters. Uh, but we do those tabletop exercises of scenario planning and doing all those kind of things, so on a big scale. But it's not like there's a book that says, if this happens, flip to page 55 and here's your answer. But you do all those scenario tra training. So I, I think you, know, you should feel good about what the state of Georgia's done. Again, uh, GEMA has done a fantastic job and pull a National Guard in. In fact, last year, yeah, last year, National Guard, Georgia National Guard had guard from across the state come in to go through this, this tabletop exercise and they did real drills as well. Uh, my deputy commissioner got to fly on, sitting on the back of a Chinook with the door open. He was scared to death. So uh, those are those big helicopters with the door. So they, they put him right on by the door and he's like, man, I didn't have a seat belt on. <laughs> so, all right, thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. Good luck with your class. Uh, Good to see you. Thank you. Yeah.